Thank you very much. And uh, as many others have said as well, thank you all for bringing this panel together. Uh, it's a fabulous day. I hope I won't sour it now. <laughs> <laughs> the frieze that surrounded the uh, Temple to Minerva uh, in, the form of, uh, in the Forum Transitorium features not just textiles, but textile making, more specifically. Focused mainly on the frieze's depiction of weaving technology, textile scholars tend to tentatively accept the identification of the central motif as the contest between Arachne and Minerva, but we rarely go beyond the notion of Arachne as an exquisitely skilled weaver uh, for the motivation of that motif. While Yves de Ambra's monograph on the frieze argues persuasively for this identification based on the dynamic uh, poses of the central characters, D'Ambra understandably makes relatively little of the diverse and novel textile technologies displayed in other parts of the frieze. Taking a more holistic approach, um, I will explore more fully the connections between the display of Minerva's victory over Arachne in the central narrative panel uh, and the attention to training and technology, uh, technological development rather, in textile crafts that dominates elsewhere in the frieze. I will first address the effectiveness of Arachne's um, story as a cautionary tale, uh, for which D'Ambra has argued, by connecting it more closely to contemporary literary references to Arachne. These will then be used to review the connections of Arachne's story to the focus on weaving technology in other parts of the frieze. D'Ambra argues that to Domitian, Arachne's story serves as a cautionary tale because Arachne is a rebel against authority, she offends against Minerva, and based on Ovid's metamorphosis, the tales that she weaves represent a dangerous erosion of sexual mores. Other panels displaying women again engaged in different aspects of textile work, D'Ambra sees as idealizing traditional Roman domestic virtues. In Ovid, whose versions of Arachne's story we tend to view as the canonical one because it's the most elaborate one, Arachne is strongly aligned with the poet himself, and she is portrayed as an ingenious artist with considerably more talent than her divine opponent. Minerva's revenge on Arachne appears not so much as justified vengeance on the impious, but rather as an unflattering example of wounded despotic pride. Why would an emperor, much less uh, Domitian, pick a motif that has that potential to invite sympathy with such an authority bucking figure? By looking beyond Ovid to the slightly later but still Augustan Astronomica of Manilius, uh, we may better gauge the contemporary attitudes to Arachne's story. The relevant section of Manilius deals with the signs of the zodiac and the characteristics of people born under each sign. In the section on Aries, rich in abundant wool, Arachne and Minerva's contest is mentioned only very briefly in the bolded line, but the theme of textile work in combination with skill that is sabotaged by hubris present throughout the section adds depth to the mythological reference. The length of that makes it significant, sorry. Um, the description of the cyclical nature of sheep sharing takes a full three lines and the length makes it uh, stand out. Um, that description is focalized through the ram himself. He is rich, then loses his wealth, i.e. he's shorn of his wool, he takes new hearts and gathers his ambitions again, rises from nothing only to fall again. He is condemned by his very ability to regrow his fleas. Manilius implies that the ram sees his abundantly growing fleas only in terms of his own individual wealth uh, and his splendid appearance, although it's also pointed out that through numerous different crafts, his abundance comes to benefit the world at large. Then, three fast-paced lines illustrate this. People roll up uh, raw wool and comb it, 
they spin and weave it, and finally buy and sell the garments made. The importance of textile production is emphatically stated in 133. No society, even one that rejects luxury, can manage without it. And for that reason, Minerva has declared it her own responsibility, a task that is worthy of her own involvement. In the line most crucial to us, Menelaus states that for this reason, Minerva claimed greatness for defeating Arachne. Although no further details are given about Arachne's own attitude, the contrast between the ram's egoistic delight in his wealth and uh, the benefits uh, that his wool brings to the world at large um, suggests that Menelaus's Minerva sees the contrast, uh, sees the contest with Arachne as one that is about far more than just weaving skill. The passage then closes with the assertion that those born under Arius' sign are suited to these and similar crafts, but also, like Arachne, constantly seek individual recognition and praise. The Arachne Minerva contest is reinterpreted as one of individualism versus a commitment to the common good. Minerva's victory in Manilius comes to represent the sharing of skills in textile work with a wider community. That's quite different from Ovid. Approaching the Arachne motif via Manilius thus creates a closer, even causal, relationship between the central cautionary tail panel and the representation of the processes of textile production elsewhere in the frieze. Minerva appropriates and shares Arachne's crafts with her followers. She also assumes Arachne's contemporary association with, with skilled invention. While Ovid's focus is on Arachne as a skilled and imaginative weaver, writers in the Flavian period emphasize her technological invention. Pliny the Elder, however implausibly, credits her with the invention of, the, of linen production, and Statius suggests that she was the first tapestry weaver. The central panel then implicitly comes to express Minerva's ability to harness and bestow on her followers, not just Arachne's skill, but also the advantages of technological development. This matches the focus on technological detail in other parts of the frieze, um, for example, the scene where Minerva demonstrates the use of a distaff, and of course, particularly in the frieze's prominent display of two beam looms. While this iconographic representation of a Roman two beam loom provides only a terminus antiquem for Roman use of this type of loom, repeated mentions of warp weighted looms in Augustan poetry hint that the two-beam loom was still, at the time of construction here, a relatively recent addition to Roman weaving technology. And that, I think, explains the freezer's interest in the specifics of its operation. We have two panels showing two um, women working together on a loom each. One woman reaches up uh, to the top of the loom frame. Uh, she grasps something in her hand while the other woman extends her hand upward as if to pass something uh, up or to receive something back. The question here becomes whether they display these panels display the same work element or different ones, and if so, which ones? First, as noted by others, the relative positions of the women in both scenes correspond uh, corresponds tantalizingly well to the passing of warp yarn between workers involved in warping, especially if you're thinking about a tubular setup on the two beam loom. There are, however, subtle differences between the two panels that hint at a display of different work elements. In this panel, the straight side of the object held up by the seated woman and its length suggests that it might be a small weaving sword um, like smallish bone weaving swords found in Pompeii, or, uh, holy, uh, or the holy flat type uh, that, has been, that has proven to be very effective uh, in 
uh, reconstructions of weaving on the two beam loom. If so, weaving is already underway here. The standing woman reaching upwards uh, might then be operating a mechanism to lower the shed rod. The position of her hand suggests a downward pulling action, whereas the seated weaver might reach up to use the small weaving sword to further open the new shed. While the lack of evidence for similar systems of operating the shed rods with a centrally placed handle uh, in later Roman iconography or indeed in ethnographic parallels speak against that interpretation, I think it still remains a possibility because moving the shed rod is the most frequently repeated work element where you need to do stuff at the top of the two beam loom. The depiction of the standing woman in the other panel is subtly different. The object that she uh, is grasping with her left hand goes over the middle of the upper beam. I think interpretations of this object as individual or bundles of warp threads are unsatisfactory. Rather, it appears as a solid strap that extends downward, as this would prevent an even spacing of warp threads across the top beam we may be looking not at the warping of a tubular setup, but at the gradual letting down of a warp stretch between loose rods tied to the horizontal beams with cords or straps. If so, we are seeing not the beginning, but rather the end of weaving here, a motif that is appropriate given the position of this panel at the further end of the extant uh, frieze. Now, the damage to the frieze precludes a definite conclusion on these questions, but it's evident that the frieze displays working elements that are done differently in the two-beam loom compared to how they would be done in the warp-weighted loom. Warping, shedding, completion, and the direction of weaving. Now, why is this important to Domitian? It's easy to say that the display of female virtuous woolwork is connected to Domitian's efforts to revitalize Roman morals, paralleled in his harsh punishments of offending Vestal virgins, but set alongside the cautionary tales of Arachne's individualistic hubris, it also offers a counterpoint to an emerging Stoic paradigm of auxorial loyalty where wives supporting or outshining their husbands in individual moral strength are lauded even though they transgress against the norms for female behavior. Pliny the Younger's letters position Aria, wife of Paetus, and Fania, who goes into exile with her husband, uh, as icons of Stoic virtue, and Flavian Epic prominently features several uh, similar examples. So Domitian's display of the paradigmatic female activity of textile work instead advocates a realization of conjugal loyalty where spouses are committed partners with distinct responsibilities, both working for increased prosperity. Arachne's story suggests that female dedication should serve shared goals, whether within a spousal unit or within the empire. Domitian's point is not merely a moral one. The detailed depiction of textile tools and the repeated display of a loom type still rarely paralleled at the time create a pronounced focus on the potential societal and economic output of female industriousness, expertise, and technological development. Overall, the frieze thus reinforces and refractures, perhaps, the state-bearing role of Roman wives by connecting it specifically to economic development and success. Thank you.